Welcome to this new video series that I'm going to be doing. I'm, I'm so, so deeply ready and at the point where it is time for me to go down this road. It's time for me to do this. I've been through enough. I've been pushed to the edge. I basically lost every meaningful connection and relationship that I had in my life because of this. And I'm at the point now to where I'm either going to go crazy and, and <laughs> like, I don't know how to put all of this out there. And so I decided rather than, uh, you know, do something stupid facing all of my problems and issues with all of this, the better solution is to take all of my frustration, all of my trauma of being born and raised and brought up in a cult and how that affected my entire life. Um, why it informs everything that I'm doing now, why it completely ruined my marriage, why it put me through a divorce, what happened in my divorce and all of that, and all of the things that I'm going to say to you for legal reasons and in this entire series, I have to say are allegedly. Now, you're never going to see me pull anything up on screen or show you anything because I don't want to give the Mormon church or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints any kind of leverage in order to cease and desist me for any kind of infringement if I use any kind of images or quotes or anything from their websites to try and demonstrate what I'm talking about. Now, the version of Mormonism that I was born and grew up in is very unique. And I say that not because it's unique in Mormonism. I just think it's unique in the world. Um, just because it is a very isolated, backwoods, doomsday version of this that has led several people in my hometown and community to do some pretty extreme things, um, including people really close to me. But everything that I'm saying is allegedly for legal reasons. I'm not going to be saying any names. When I refer to my going through my divorce, all of that is from my perspective. And when I talk about going to the church, all of this is from my perspective. And they're just stories. Okay. There are a lot of people in these stories, allegedly, that I'm going to either change their name or just refer as person number one and two and go through the stories to tell how they went. Um, because there are a lot of prominent YouTubers involved in this. There's prominent public figures. There's people who I was really close to that were completely two-faced and involved in bizarre stuff that completely unraveled my marriage in the end that sucked that relationship that I had for 20 years down the toilet, fractured my family, and ultimately is, you know, doing things where basically I'm like uh, estranged from everyone that I know. Now, right off the bat, members of the church and my family and people watching this are going to say all these cliche things. They're going to say, well, Carl left the church and now he can't leave it alone. Carl's now an apostate. Carl is now an antichrist. He is now, uh, you know, totally influenced by evil spirits or something. Or they're going to say, I'm lost and fallen. I have fallen away. I am part of the great and spacious building. These are all sort of just like mentalities and sayings that are within the church that I was brought up in to try and make it feel impossible to leave because you don't want to become a part of that group over there. So let's go back. This is going to be part one. I'm probably going to have to do this in a multi-part series because I want to really get into the details. When I've told parts of this story to other people, even when I get into the underground child rituals and child trafficking labor stuff that I was involved in as a kid and 
and some of the weird occult rituals that go on in the Mormon temples that I was a part of from the time I was a child, all of that kind of stuff. I realized to me, it's just stuff that I grew up with. It's all things that I thought were normal as they were happening because everybody that I knew and everyone around me was a part of it, including my family, my older siblings, my parents, my entire identity and community, everyone that I went to school with and that I went to work with and all of that all the way up, even into getting married, basically up until about, about 10 years ago, uh, all of this was like being in a complete Truman show. It's like living in uh, on an island or in an isolated village the way that it went for me. So let's go back. I was born in 1978 in October. And this is a time before the internet. This is before even a lot of like, there wasn't even satellite TV or, uh, you know, like different cable options or there was no internet. There was no cell phones. There was none of that back in, in that day. Going up, uh, growing up and, and going up through the seven, late 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, that entire childhood and youth is a paradox for me because it was full of tremendous freedom and a lot of just like time riding around on my bike, having fun, doing lots of cool things with my friends, and mostly highly unsupervised, uh, raising myself, having a lot of fun. But at the same time, I was born in this small town uh, called Rexburg, Idaho. Now, at the time, there was a university there called Ricks College, which is owned by the, the Mormon Church. Uh, they, their official name is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints because it's so important to them that they're seen as being Christian, which we'll get into all the reasons why that's kind of, a, kind of something that they're doing as a ploy. Um, I think the members individually are like Christians, but the way the actual rich, the Freemasonry rituals are done and the type of um, ordinance work and where all of the founding of the church comes from and, and how that all started is very non-Christian when you understand it from a different perspective. But that's beside the point. We can get into all of that, that later. But when I was born in 1978, my family lived in uh, Rexburg, Idaho, and this is a community that is completely founded in Mormonism. This is like living in a tiny village isolated from the world. Everyone there is either white or they are the remnants of Japanese refugee camps from World War II. That's the truth. So I had friends growing up, um, you know, that were mixed race. They were either Latino Mexican migrant workers that were working illegally on the local farms, which where I lived in Rexburg is basically like an island, a small community surrounded by nothing but farms. And when my family especially moved out of town uh, to Sugar City later, when I was like seven years old, that was even worse. And that got even more isolating. Um, but growing up in Rexburg, a lot of my memories were just uh, basically my, my parents both working and trying hard. My parents loved us. They were very good to us as kids. They were not abusive. And all of this that I'm going to tell you is I think my parents' best effort to do what they thought was right. And everything that I'm saying, uh, I pin on the Mormon church. I pin on how I was, how my community and the way I was raised and all of that went uh, on a lot of that. And I think that my parents and family and, and a lot of that and the people, the good members of the church are really victims of this entire pyramid scheme. So as a child, it was kind of unusual for me because my parents were seen as sort of inactive. So we went to church sometimes, but not all of the time. There was a lot of judgment towards my father because my father smoked cigarettes. He uh, was in the army and stuff and, and got out, had kind of a rough life growing up and kind of a wild childhood. And so he had a smoking problem and stuff. And he, uh, when I was a kid all growing up, would drink beer. 
And as a Mormon in the church, that's absolutely not allowed. They have this uh, word of wisdom, this code of conduct, where you're not allowed to drink coffee. You're not supposed to even really drink caffeine. You're not supposed to um, definitely not drink any alcohol or partake in that or tobacco. And there's a lot of other weird gray areas in there about like not even not even eating meat, um, kind of a vegetarian sort of ploy. But nobody follows it. Every, all the Mormons drink energy drinks and they drink. They're addicted to Diet Coke and everything. And it's totally hypocritical when you get down to it. They cherry pick the parts of it that, that will get them their, their temple recommend and keep them worthy to go to church. But really, there's so many gray areas in there. It's crazy. And none of it makes sense. Um, but I was raised in this town where the entire college university there is owned by the church. So you have Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, and then this offshoot up in southeast Idaho where I was born called Ricks College. And so everybody in the community is Mormon, uh, and most of the people work at the college, and so did my parents. Um, So when you went to work, it was all church run. When you went to school, you know, everybody was saying prayers and everybody was Mormon. And all of your friends were Mormon. It was just the way of life. I don't really think I even had an understanding that there were other churches. I don't think I really under ha- had an understanding that there were like other different beliefs or religions. And none of those other options or opportunities or belief systems were ever afforded to me. They were never presented to me as a child, not growing up. I didn't confront any of that till I was 19 and a missionary in Arkansas. (laughs) We'll get into that in another part of the series as well when I served a mission and what that was like. But growing up in Rexburg, because my father drank and smoked and kind of went to the bars and had that reputation, my family was sort of frowned upon in the community. My parents were, you know, middle to low income, and so we sort of struggled and moved from house to house renting different places and they were doing their best. Again, I don't blame my parents, but ultimately there was this desire deep down in the community and this pressure in the community and from my friends and from family that we all go to church. And I would get taken to church with my mom and the experience was always so wild because when you go to church as a Mormon, everything is segregated by age and by gender. Um, especially when I was growing up. They've changed the meeting schedules and that around, but it used to be three hours of church every Sunday. And when you went to church, you would sit with the meetings where you were allowed to sit with your family. You're not really allowed to like be affectionate towards each other and you're not supposed to talk. You just sit there and be quiet and listen to the people talking and speaking up front. And so it's kind of this thing where you just sit there together as a family. And then as soon as that hour's done, everybody divides up into their different classes. So all the kids go into kids' classes. The women's women go into Relief Society and the women's classes. The men go into the men's classes. And then there is like Sunday school and other classes in the third block. And some of those get mixed around in different orders by the timeline. But basically... In the meetings, most of the time at church, the kids and the adults are separated and then they're split up by gender, right? And so the women go here and the men go there. And that's the same all the way up when you're doing the rituals in the temple. In fact, you don't even get to be together with your wife in the temple until at the very end of all of the rituals. And then when you're in that room together, you're not supposed to talk. You're supposed to sit there quietly and like just like pray or something. (laughs) Anyway, so it's very unusual. I grow up in this community where everybody in the town has this exact same belief system. There's no people of color. There's no black people. There's uh, just maybe a few that played on the college football team, but really I can't even remember that. It's like it was completely a whitewashed town and everybody was Mormon. And the leaders of the church and the prophet of the church, as I started to grow up in that, were very 
heavy on this fear mongering around the Cold War and Russia, right? So there is this attitude that everybody in the community, every family is supposed to have three years of food storage because the end of the world is coming, right? So right from the beginning, my childhood is sort of baked in and flavored with this fear mindset that this doomsday is going to happen that there's going to be this total cataclysm like in the book of revelations and only different. Um, and the way all that's going to play out is very uniquely Mormon to Mormons. And then there's even extremist spinoffs and books and people that get into alternative versions of the Mormon doomsday where it involves like uh, near death experience visions and, um, having cities of light where people flee into the wilderness and basically camp in the wilderness to survive the apocalypse and everything, a lot of stuff. But this was, so to me, was completely normal to go to church and hear these things talked about. Like this was reality. This was coming one day, right? And then my family made a decision um, as we're growing up, a lot of my younger years, I don't have a lot of memories, just like riding my bike and goofing around, having a pretty normal childhood. Because my dad smoked and drank, we didn't go to church a lot. And so in those really early years, it was just sort of like what everybody was doing. But my family didn't like really take it all that serious. Except for I did have uh, my uh, an older brother who was very, very passionate about the church. And that ended up becoming something that has also caused a lot of difficulties in my life and uh, psychologically and through life and trauma and realizations of, of just like what I've been through and everything. So to give you an idea of what it was like growing up when I was right before I was eight years old, my family moved into an even smaller town out on the fringes called Sugar City, Idaho. And this is basically a tiny little potato farming town where most of the people that live out there are uh, working at the university at some capacity. So they're all employees for the church and also going to church. And everyone at school and everybody that I know, everyone in my entire community as far as I know, for uh, probably a five mile radius is all going to church with me. We're all going to the same church. So the guy down the road and on the corner, he's actually like the bishop. He's the leader of the local congregation and the neighbor across the street. He's his counselor. And then so everybody in the entire community has like a calling or a role and is a member of this church. So for me as a child, growing up in this environment for everybody in that environment. It's like you're literally in this isolated bubble, like the Truman show where everything revolves around the truth of the gospel, the truth of the book of Mormon, the truth of the church and its prophet and leaders and what that's all about. Meanwhile, nobody's really telling you, the advanced levels of this nobody's preparing you or really telling you what actually goes on in the in the rituals inside the temple and in they're inside their big uh structures that they build uh to do their ceremonies and rituals in and i was just sort of kind of like groomed up into all that and let me tell you what that was like so and this is all things that um if a Mormon active member and if my family members listen to this, they're going to really look at this like I'm twisting it. Like what I'm about to tell you, I'm really just taking some totally absurd side of it and seeing it in some ugly light. And that's not true at all. That's not what happens. But I'm just going to tell you the facts and you can choose. And I'm going to tell you the way it was for me. And what, especially from the perspective of how I look back on it now. So this is what it's like as a young Mormon kid for me um, and what it was like to go to church and to do that, especially, you know, with a father that struggled with what they considered worthiness issues because he smoked and drank and was trying to quit that. So when we moved out to Sugar City, everything went to like a whole other level. And part of that was because I was growing up and becoming more aware 
but also because when you turn eight years old in the Mormon church, it's expected that you get baptized and you become like an official member of the church. Now, all of this starts before any of that. When you're brand new born as an infant, they do a ritual with you as an infant where they take you up in front of the congregation as a baby and they do a prayer where certain groups of people get together and they basically just give you a blessing. And usually they're just like a prayer of good wishes and that that good things will happen to you. It's sort of just like a fortune telling thing where you're blessing the baby to have a good life, you know. And those are usually pretty wonderful and they're like a a sweet ceremony to introduce the baby. But you also, at that moment, get up and announce and officially write that baby in onto the records of the church. And you offer that baby up basically as a donation, as a servant to the church at that, at that moment. Even if it's not by law, symbolically it's done on the records of the church, you actually sign things as a parent and you pick out the baby's name. So in the same way that you choose your child's name in the hospital. So as a baby, my name was chosen and given and written into the records of the church as a Mormon, as an infant, right? And then they dress me all in white and they go up there and do the, the baby blessing and they hold you up as the baby in front of the congregation. Everybody stands around you in a circle and they sit there and they hold you and they say a prayer and they say, your name will be officially known on the records of the church as Carl Andresen. And they say your full name out officially. And the clerk of the church writes all that down and they go in there and they put it in the official church records. So you're locked in. And from that day on, and especially after you're baptized, when you're an infant and your parents choose before you're even old enough to know what's going on, they put your names in as officially uh, on the records of the church and what your name is for that. And a an whole ordinance that happens, a ritual and a prayer that happens up in front of the whole congregation. So even as a baby, um, you're put right in the middle of it, right on the records of the church. And your name going on the records of the church at that moment as an infant never leaves you. It haunts you even if you try to leave the church. Even when you remove your records from the church, you have to basically have lawyers tell them like, like a cease and desist to get them to stop uh, basically sending people over there, over to your house to try and get you to come back and, and kind of harassing you and everything. Your records and lifelong history follows you everywhere. Uh, no matter where you move, they figure out where you moved and they update your address in the system of the church and track your location. Even if you haven't been to church in years, they figure out where you're at and they update your records. And all of that happens from the minute that you're an infant before you have any kind of an awareness of the world at all just even as a newborn baby. The first Sunday, basically, that you are old enough to go to church, this ritual is done and you are made an official name on the records of the church. And then from there, you go up and you basically go through Sunday school and primary school. And they sing all these songs when they separate the kids into these separate classrooms and they divide you up according to age range. And I get it. So, you, you know, you you want to teach like all the five-year-olds together and the six-year-olds together. And then there's a teacher kind of asked to volunteer to do that. But they all teach out of lesson manuals and everybody teaches the same songs. And all of these songs are basically reinforcing to you that the founder of the church, Joseph Smith, is the true prophet. And he was like chosen by God to do this miraculous thing and that the book of mormon the mormon version of what happened uh during the time of jesus in the bible what was going on over here in america that is like the whole book of mormon and so they're basically you're singing all these songs about the book of mormon you're singing songs about the leaders of the church the prophet joseph smith like he's some kind of a hero and a prophet and that None of these guys, they won't lead you astray. I mean, they they literally have a song 
called Follow the Prophet. And it sounds like a Jewish or like a, like a Hebrew uh, old um, ceremonial song or something. But it, it's like, follow the prophet, follow the prophet, follow the prophet. Don't go astray. Follow the prophet, follow the prophet, follow the prophet. He knows the way. And imagine like you and all your friends and all these kids are all singing this together. <laughs> and, and then you're also singing these songs about being a missionary, like growing up and turning 19 and serving the church. And it's like you're singing these. I hope they call me on a mission when I have grown a foot or two. I ho hope that soon I will be ready. And you have like all these songs about preparing to serve the church and about following the prophet and doing what he says and don't question anything. And they get up there and the leaders, your best friend's mom gets up or your mom gets up and they're all giving these little primary lessons to kids. And they teach you all these things like the, the leaders of the church, they can't lie to you. If they do try to lie to you, God will just strike them dead. So therefore, you can just trust everything that they do and say like it's a fact, you know. And here you are just like this little doe-brained kid sitting there with all of your friends like, oh, okay. Like you have no clue what you're being taught, you know. And they, your entire life as a child, my entire life was like I was raised with these stories from the Mormon scriptures, from the Book of Mormon and out of the Bible out of another book called the Pearl of Pearl of Great Price. And of course, like these biblical stories and the stories in the Book of Mormon, they're all stories of like bloodshed and fighting and wars and people cutting other people's heads off and just violence and people escaping capture and then returning to murder someone and steal things and like brothers fighting other brothers. And the entire Book of Mormon is like, about how this family from Jerusalem during the time of Jeremiah in the Old Testament, uh, the Book of Mormon claims that they, this family escapes Jerusalem, one family, um, and they hook up with some a neighbor family to get some girls, you know, and they build a boat and they come over here to America. And then they basically become all of the Native Americans and South Americans and, and Latinos. And what happens is through their wickedness, they get cursed with brown skin, right? So the whole book from its origins is about this racist agenda, this colonialized agenda of like Native Americans and brown skinned people are brown skinned because they've been cursed because they couldn't keep the commandments of God, right? because they're mean to their brother and they're not obedient and they don't keep their faith, they're not saying their prayers, they slowly turn into these naked savages that live out in the wilderness and they start fighting their other brothers and that becomes the whole story of the Native American people. So the entire thing, you know, I mean, and we'll get into like later when I started learning about how the Book of Mormon was actually created and all that in another, in another video. But for the purposes of this and what it was like for me growing up, just keep in mind that these teachings in this community of just nothing but white kids and white people everywhere I looked, and then I'm, I'm being taught to follow the prophet, and they're all white people too, all the leaders of the church, you know. And, and then the Book of Mormon, I'm being told this is true. It's another testament of Jesus Christ. It's the truest book of any book on earth, you're going to get closer to God by reading the Book of Mormon than by reading any other book on earth. Those are, are literally things that I'm being taught as a toddler in primary school. And I'm learning all these stories and they're all baked in with this kind of racism and baked in with stories of like, you know, it's okay to go cut someone's head off if they're, if they're damaging the work of the Lord, you know, if they're like interfering with what God wants to do, then it's justified if the spirit, if the Holy Spirit tells you to do it. And there's all these stories in the book like that. But as a kid growing up, 
they become these like amazing chronicles of Narnia, like Harry Potter, like fantasy stories, but they're real to you. When you're growing up as a kid, these are true stories. When the people in the Book of Mormon go over here and they cross the river and they go to battle with their brothers and all that stuff, it's like, oh my gosh, to me, it was like true. And I was told that it was true. And not only that, it's the truest book on earth. And it contains all of the secrets to get back to heaven and to get close to God. And so I'm reading this like, oh my gosh, this character Nephi in the first chapter and his family and Nephi there. And these people are like my heroes, right? So as much as you feel like it was like crazy to learn about like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, like you got to imagine growing up in this type of cult environment where from a small kid, I'm singing songs in primary about these people in the Book of Mormon and these stories about their lives and all the things that they did that aren't even real. <laughs> and I'm and all my family and my parents and everybody, it's like these these manufactured counterfeit stories that are half of them plagiarized from other places are all the ingrained and baked into our culture as a belief system. They're in the stories that we tell each other. And I'm telling you, being a Mormon is like a full-time thing. It's not like a lot of other religions where you just go on Sunday or go on Easter. I'm telling you, being a Mormon means you go on Sunday for three hours. And if you have important callings, you're also staying going in early for meetings, staying after for meetings, going and doing uh, back in the day before they, they changed a lot of this around and changed the programs and how they, they call it and do it for tax purposes and stuff. But they used to have family home evening where you on every Monday night you got together and did church meeting at home as a family. You're supposed to pray together every morning and night like as a married couple and read the, the Book of Mormon and the scriptures together as a family all the time and personally. Uh, every Tuesday night is mutual night, which is where you get together with, if you're a teenager or a kid, you go back to the church on Tuesday night to do youth activities, like to hang out, uh, do boy scouts, go, go camping. And some of that's really cool, but it also revolves around a lot of shady stuff, a lot of child abuse, a lot of child trafficking, a lot of forced labor and, and, a lot of that happened to me and um, growing up in this little Truman show, of Sugar City, Idaho, as a, as a Mormon kid. But I'm like going to church. And when we moved to Sugar City, all of this escalated, OK, because I was getting ready to turn eight years old, which means I'm going to get baptized, and become a, a like a full working active member of the church where I'm doing things as a young man, having callings where I have responsibilities and I'm starting to do things like where you're stepping up from just being a little kid to having an active role, doing, participating in the rituals every Sunday of the church. Um, and even going to the rituals at the temple in the basement and doing like necromancy stuff at night and things. And all of that was about to happen to me when I was like seven years old and we moved from Rexburg out to Sugar City. Up until then, it was just like a lot of singing, going to church, you know, sitting through meetings and being bored like a normal kid. It wasn't really pushed in my face. But when we moved out to Sugar City, there was a change where because my dad's job shifted, they said at the university, at Rick's College, the church university, that everybody working there now has to have an active temple recommend, meaning the big Mormon temples that you go in to do rituals for dead people. You have to have a permit from your local church leader and then his boss and all that and go through this interview, pr interview process. So you can't be smoking, can't be drinking, can't be drinking coffee. Uh, you have to have an upstanding membership and maybe even be volunteering in some kind of a way within the church. And so now my father 
is going through all these changes. So he's trying to quit smoking. He's trying to quit drinking. He's trying to go off a of coffee. And then my parents start trying to drink decaf. A lot of these different pressures start to shift. And the desire for my parents to go back and get married in the temple, in the Mormon temple, suddenly became a thing. Now, I need to clarify this because as a Mormon, the pinnacle of your faith, the most important thing that you can do, the ultimate way, the only way that you can even get into the highest level of heaven, and that's not even exaggerating, the only way that you can get there is by going into a Mormon temple, doing all of the rituals, learning all of the secret handshakes, putting on the underwear with the Freemasonry symbols on it and wearing it every day of your life. And most of all, you got to get married in the temple. They even call it a sealing ceremony, like the way that you would seal a scroll, like with a wax stamp, like it's fixed, like this can't be broken. It's like a, a bond. And you're supposed to get married to someone in the temple, and that is going to last for eternity. And that's your ticket to be an eternal family, a family that can be together forever in heaven. And if you don't do that, if you don't go and get married in the temple, then when you die, till death do us part. And when you die, apart you go. And if you just have a civil marriage and you just marry somebody like in a normal chapel or in your backyard or at the local park, that ain't good enough. You got to go in the Mormon temple. You have to have that uh, recommend card, which is a permission slip or an access card to get in you and your wife, and you have to go in and get married in there or you can't get to heaven. And so, of course, my mom wants to get married in the temple, and my dad does too. And the whole community is about that, and the whole religion is about that, and my whole family is about it. And I had no idea what it was about, but in my mind, I was being taught in church all the time and at home that that was the most important thing that you could do as a Mormon is to get married in the temple. And I was starting to realize going from seven to eight years old that um, as soon as I was baptized, my family, my parents were going to get sealed together or married. So they were already married and had me and my three older brothers. But then the decision is like, we have to get married in the temple now or we're not going to be together in heaven, right? And so this process of like, now we're all going to go to church. Now we're going to do family home evening. You guys have got to attend. We can't miss. Dad's going to church now. He's quitting drinking and smoking. All of this on the surface in a community and in Mormonism. And, and usually you look at this and you would say, well, this is great. Mormonism, you know, it's a refining thing. It's cleaning people up. It, you know, he wants to get married and be together as a family forever. and so he's going through all of this and willing to do it to be together forever as a family. But when you're, when you realize what it's all about and the rituals involved, the necro, the occult necromancy stuff, where the temple comes from, where the book of Mormon came from, who the founder Joseph Smith really was and what they were doing when they came up with all this stuff. And you realize, you know, later on, like I do now, what this is all about. The idea that families are completely swept up and sucked in to this lifestyle, like it's the ticket to heaven and family togetherness and happiness, it flies right in the face of the fact that when you go to church on Sunday, the men sit over here and the women sit over here and nobody's allowed to talk and the kids go in this room. And even when you go to the temple, the women sit on the left, the men sit on the right. You're not allowed to talk to each other until the very end and then you're supposed to whisper not even supposed to talk. And the whole thing is, is backwards. And, and in some crazy way, the, because since you're a little child, it, it's put into you all the way up. You don't even see it coming. Now, I want to point out this other thing that happens. It's very common. Every first Sunday of the month, they do this fast and testimony meeting where everybody is supposed to go without food and water and you don't you don't eat or drink for 24 hours and then you go that 
to church that Sunday and you pay 10% of your money, of your income from the last month to tithing and offerings. So you give 10% of everything you make to the church every month. And then you also don donate to what they call fast offerings. So the food that you would have eaten and the money you would have spent on that food for fasting and going without food and water, you donate some of that to fast offerings. What people don't know is that the clerk in the office just basically takes all that money, adds it up, and goes and de uh, deposits it into one account at the local bank, and then that goes all into one big account back at church headquarters. They don't even split it out that great. I mean, it's it's pretty crazy the way that it happens. I know because I was a ward clerk for a while, and I did it. It was one of my jobs <laughs> when I was older. But um, anyway, as a kid. My life heading towards getting baptized completely changed in this uh, belief system. My parents wanting to go and get sealed in the temple and getting married in the Mormon temple was a completely bizarre incident for me. Um, and all of this started to change my life to where the, the cult mindset started coming home a lot more. It started be, getting pushed in my face. And most of all, um, I could say that the, some of my family members started going from just, you know, being kind of casual members of the church to being very obsessed with it. Now, this is how it is when you're 19, you go on a Mormon mission. And I'm the youngest of four brothers. So when I was basically like four or five years old, my oldest brother left and went to uh, the Antofagasta, Chile, down in South America mission. So he went down there, uh, totally took the Book of Mormon down there and was made to basically teach uh, and volunteered to teach everybody down in the country of Chile that their heritage is actually from this family that came over from Jerusalem. So they're actually Jews from uh, a tribe of Israel that came to America. And then because their ancestors were wicked and they started breaking the commandments and doing bad things, their skin turned brown and now they're actually the Lamanites. <laughs> That's kind of a, a, a weird thing. I know it sounds like a weird jargon because it is, but uh, basically to go down there and convert these people and to baptize them, uh, get them to come to church and to strip them away of their natural cultural heritage and their background, who they are and their customs and everything and convince them, no, 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 no. You come from this guy, either Laman and Lemuel, who came over on a boat who were Jewish people from Israel, who... Um, started doing bad things, and then God cursed him with brown skin. That's why you've got brown skin. Now, until like 1978, uh, black people couldn't even work in the church or volunteer in the church or hold the priesthood or any of that because of the belief system around uh, brown skin people or black people being cursed uh, with dark skin. And that was something that I was just <laughs> as crazy as it is and as racist as it is to me now, something that I just grew up with like, oh, that's just the way it is. Right. And so, you know, my poor brother gets sent down there for two years. So when I'm like just a young kid, like five, six years old, he's gone for two years and then comes back speaking Spanish. And in my mind, I'm like, my brother's just gone to work on the farm. Right. I didn't know he's like working on a farm at the time. So, oh, he's working on the farm. And all of a sudden he comes back and I'm starting to figure it out. And then my next brother, he turns 19 and he goes on a mission and he goes to Los Angeles, California. And when he came back off of his mission, it was like, I didn't even know who this guy was. It was like, suddenly, I, I, he's probably watching this video now. All of this I'm saying again is from my perspective, of the trauma that I went through with it all. I'm trying really hard not to have any hard feelings and animosity about it, but I really think it's time in order for me to move on, for me to put all of this out there. I love my family, but I do not love the church. I don't love the cult. 
I don't like what it did to my brothers. I don't like what it did to my relationships with my family. I don't like any of that. So I'm telling all this just basically as a way of awareness. And all of this is just like allegedly, according to my own experiences and perception, uh, which they're going to disagree with anyways. Um, but when my one of my brothers came back off of his mission from Los Angeles, it was like he was just completely different, obsessed like a like a zealot like uh you we got to wake up and do prayers together we're reading scriptures together we're doing family home evening like church meetings at home and suddenly there's this environment and this culture within the home that that just went up this whole other level where there was a lot of guilt tripping like why well why didn't you do that and do you really you know the intensity of coming back off of 2 years of being immersed in the church and just talking about it and teaching it all day. It was like, it was like a machine. It was like shoved in our faces every day. Like, this is true. This is the truth. And the Book of Mormon is true. And did you read your scriptures today? Today, And it was like always these little spiritual check-ins. And all it did was give me this complex, right? Like of, of guilt and everything and shame. And like, like I'm not good enough. Oh my gosh. But at the same time, I look up to my brothers so much and they're coming back from their missions with these crazy stories. And they sound like they're heroes. You know, they're going down there, baptizing all these people and converting them into the church. And wow, like I want to do this. And like the people in the Book of Mormon, they're my heroes. And I am following the prophet. You know, I'm like singing the songs. and I'm trying my best to be a good kid. Meanwhile, I'm being taught these insane things, you know, like that are totally paradoxes to me now. And one of the things that happened that I want to end this part one with was the process of getting baptized and being given the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then we'll end on that. And then we'll pick up in the part two of what it was like going and getting sealed in the temple with my parents, uh, going through the temple the first time. And then starting to get introduced into temple work, uh, necromancy ordinances and occult rituals at the age of like 9 and 10, just as a young kid. Um, so for baptism in the Mormon church, the founders of the church in the very early days, you know, like uh, now we're talking 180 years ago. So really not that long ago. These guys, Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and the other founders of Mormonism, uh, whichever way you want to slice it, they started polygamy. They reinstated Old Testament polygamy, and that included underage kids. That included children as young as 14 once they moved to Salt Lake, even younger. Um, when Brigham Young moved to Utah, they were even getting involved in like child trafficking, kidnapped kids out of the Navajo tribe uh, that they were getting from New Mexico through a bunch of slave trading and things. So there was everything from child trafficking to slave trading, uh, lots of child abuse, underage marriages that were going on and polygamy. So that there was one man, the prophet and leader of the church, who at the time was also trying to run for president and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, he not only wrote this really racist book about this fake origin story of the Native American people in the Americas, but he reinstitutes polygamy. And before that, one of the real shady things he does to set this up is they designate the age of accountability to be eight years old. That means that they're saying that when a child is eight years old, they are completely adult enough to be able to make decisions to um, follow God and to do what is right and to be personally accountable for their actions. Meaning now when you're eight years old, that's when it's like some switch and heaven gets flipped. And now suddenly you are cognitively able of committing a sin. Whereas before you're totally innocent and there's no accountability. Now at eight years old, <clears throat> you are of what they called in the church. They officially call this the age of accountability. Now, really, to me, outside of the church now, I realize that's just this really shady way of trying to push the age of consent all the way down to eight for 
marriages for underage polygamy. And so that you can say, this child is eight. The prophet has decreed from God through a revelation that eight years old is old enough to be accountable, to, to commit sin, and to be able to make decisions for yourself, uh, you know, whether your parents agree or not. That's kind of the underhanded attitude behind it all. But in baptism, they ask you very specific questions. And they don't have to do with like whether or not you're like really a good person or whether or not you're volunteering in the community, whether or not your future goals or ambitions are full of integrity or any of that. The interview questions that they give you when you go to church as an eight-year-old kid or like seven years old when you're getting ready to turn eight, because they want to get you right on your birthday, man, right when you're eight years old. In fact, if you wait past your birthday to get baptized, people start bugging your parents like, well, what's wrong? Does your kid have problems? Has he been like doing bad things? Does he have issues? Like, is why is he not getting baptized? Is he not worthy? And they are start spreading those rumors. So your kid had better be ready at eight years old, basically on the first baptismal date after his eight year birthday, or you're not doing your job as a parent and a member of the church. There's that much pressure, right? So everybody I knew was getting baptized. All my friends that are a little bit older than me are turning eight. And I'm going to their baptisms, watching them get baptized. You know, none of this really occurs to me how weird this is. You know, baptism and giving the spirit to people or giving the Holy Ghost to people is a pretty common thing in a lot of religions, you know. But let me just kind of convey it now, what it's like for me looking back on it. Because what you do is you go to church, you go through these interviews, and they ask you, do you believe that Joseph Smith is a true prophet, that he is the true prophet of the church. And you have to say yes. And they ask you, do you believe in the Book of Mormon that the Book of Mormon is true? And you have to say yes. They ask you if you pay your 10%. Do you pay your tithing? Are you giving the church your money? You have to say yes. Are you obeying the word of wisdom, which is that no coffee, no alcohol, no tobacco, none of that stuff. You have to say yes to all that. You're not doing any of that. And then they start asking you about your personal activity, whether you touch yourself, whether you've touched other people, whether you have relationships with other people, all of those types of worthiness issues. And this is all stuff that comes up when you are seven years old, getting ready to turn eight. Have I looked up pornography? Have I touched a girl? Have I touched myself? Have I done this? All these questions are part of whether or not I'm worthy to get baptized. Okay. And then the day comes, they dunk you in the water, you get baptized. But then afterwards, this ritual happens where there's the laying on of hands to give you the Holy Ghost. Okay. Now, this might seem all fine. And Mormons and members of the church and my family, anybody watching this might be like, why well, everybody does that? It's not a big deal. But I, I'm just going to tell you how I see it now and the way that I see it now. Um, because you do this laying on of hand ceremony where the leader of the church, your parent, your dad, there's no women. No women are allowed to be involved in any of this. They're just got to sit there and watch. They're not even allowed to officially be a witness to the baptism. They just got to sit and watch. All they can do is bake the cookies in the kitchen, maybe say a prayer and stand there and lead the music. That's it. So the women aren't allowed to do anything. Your mom's not involved. This is all about your dad and the, the men in the church, the leaders. And so you go in and you get baptized. But then when they give you the gift of the Holy Ghost, now they do this right in front of the whole church, up in front of everybody. But they used to, back with me, just do it like in private right there after the baptism. Uh, or maybe I've even got that backwards. It's been so long now. Anyway, they get together and everybody lay, puts their hands on top of your head. Like they literally, everybody stacks their hands up in a circle and stands around you. And then they say this whole prayer where they say, um, 
by the power, you know, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, like we give you, they don't say we give you, um, we say unto you, receive the Holy Ghost. And at that moment, at eight years old, the belief is that literally God, the Spirit of God, a member of the Godhead, comes down and goes into you, like possesses you, and is in all things and through all things and knows your thoughts, knows your feelings, knows everything that you're thinking of. And now he's been assigned to you and he sees you and you have the this guide, the comforter, the Holy Ghost, the spirit of the Holy Ghost. And the promise is that if you obey, if you keep doing what you're supposed to, Joseph Smith is the prophet, reading the Book of Mormon, going to church on Sunday, doing what they tell you to do. Don't mess up. Don't touch yourself. Don't think bad, dirty thoughts about other girls. <laughs> like None of that. You can't do any of that. You can't even listen to bad music. None of that. Like, Don't drink coffee. If you can ab abide by that code, then this spirit, this Holy Ghost, is basically going to follow you around your whole life and whisper into your mind and into your emotions and tell you, through this little subtle voice inside yourself, like your conscience, like Jiminy Cricket, you know, your your the Holy Ghost is going to basically supersede your own consciousness and your own conscience. So when you're sitting there and you're thinking a thought in your head, and you're like, what should I do? Should I do this or should I do that? And you're not sure and your conscious awareness is confused. The Holy Ghost, you have the gift of the Holy Ghost now. And this invisible spirit will, will tell you the answer. He will answer your prayers. All you got to do is kneel down and pray and ask, okay? And the Holy Ghost will guide you through your entire life like a compass, right? And these stories are burned into you. There's songs about them. Everybody's doing it. You cannot wait because once you have the Holy Ghost, it's like having a guardian angel attached to you straight from God, right? But here's the thing. What is his name? Who is this ghost? <laughs> How it never occurred to me as a child, and I don't think any of the members really asked themselves, you know, in normal Christian beliefs, there is the Trinity where God the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are all one being. So it's like the Spirit of God or the essence of the One coming down and watching over you, right? But in Mormonism, the teaching is, is that these people are three separate people. And I say that people intentionally. They believe that God, the Father, was once called, his real name is Elohim, which is a mistranslation. Elohim just means like the many gods. It's like a council of gods. It comes from Samaria. It's like Elohim. It's not even, it's like not even the a correct translation. But they they believe that there's God the Father, and then his son Jesus is literally a different man. And God the Father, he used to be a guy just like me. He used to just be a normal human. And a long time ago on some other planet called Kolob in outer space, he lived, I'm not joking. It's a planet called Kolob. This is in the scriptures. That's where <clears throat> this guy Elohim lived out a normal life just like me and you and then achieved godhood and became Elohim the God. And his planet, Kolob, is like a giant crystal ball that he sits on and looks into like a giant seer stone and he controls the universe from there. Right? So it all starts to sound like kind of Scientology, right? So you've got God the Father on the crystal ball planet Kolob in outer space. And he was a man like me, but he transcended up and became a god. Now he's on his crystal ball planet Kolob up there in outer space. And he sent his son, Jesus, who's also Jehovah in the Old Testament, you know, that killed everybody and wiped everybody out and burned all the villages and everything in the Old Testament and, and destroyed all the gay people in Sodom and Gomorrah, apparently, and all that. But all of that, um, 
is ascribed to Jesus. Um, and he's Jehovah of the Old Testament who becomes Jesus of the New Testament. But then there's this, the Holy Ghost. And nobody knows who this guy is. Because in Mormonism, it's got to be three different people. It's not the same trinity manifest in three different ways, like aspects of the same God. It's literally a God head. So it's three separate people. And the Holy Ghost, I mean, let's not even talk about Heavenly Mother, God's wife. You're not even supposed to talk about him or you're going to get doomed to hell, right? It's like, we're not all about, allowed to talk about that. You're not allowed to talk about Heavenly Mother because it's all about polygamy, having multiple wives, thousands of wives in heaven for the men, right? So they don't want to talk about the wife. So they don't bring that up because it's all about hiding polygamy. They believe that they're going to have many wives in heaven, right, if they make it. But this Holy Ghost character is supposed to be a person who got a seat in the Godhead. So there's God the Father and Jesus and then the Holy Ghost. And he's a guy who hasn't been born yet. So he's never even had a body. He hasn't come to earth. He hasn't even gone to another planet or anything. There's just this crazy retrofit where this spirit entity who's never even been born who doesn't even know what it's like to be a human who has no clue what it's like on earth it's just this essence like a, a ghost and he gets to be one of the godhead so he is an equal with the father and the son he is the third part of that he is the holy ghost and this guy in mormonism even though nobody knows his name He's not the father or Jesus. He's this third dude. Imagine, right? He, he is basically put into you in this ceremony where they, everybody lays their hands on your head when you're eight years old and they say unto you, receive the Holy Ghost. So it's like they're possessing the child with this unnamed, unknown entity that's supposed to now take over their awareness, take over their consciousness and get them on the hamster wheel of obedience for the pyramid scheme of the cult of Mormonism. So now all of your thoughts have now been infiltrated. Every emotion now is overlaid with the watcher. Now the Holy Ghost, this entity, sees all things. And even when you're in your bedroom alone at night, there he is. And if you do anything wrong, he is so offended He's going to leave and go straight back to dad and tell Heavenly Father. He's going to tell God, and then you've got to repent. And the only way that you can repent and to make it better and to get the Holy Ghost to come back and protect you again is if you go into church, you do their rituals every Sunday, but most of all, you got to go in alone as a little kid and talk to the local bishop, to your church leader. So you go in there, you got to shut the door and be alone with this guy and talk about what you did. You got to confess things to him. Meanwhile, he's like one of your best friends at school. He's their dad. And really, this guy's not even qualified. He's never been to school to do any of this. He's not a therapist or a counselor. He literally just owns a lawnmower company in town or he's like a chiropractor and he's just volunteering to be in there. But what he's doing is talking to little eight-year-old kids about whether they have looked at pornography or not. And the whole thing is crazy. And so at eight years old, I was going through all of this. It was getting baked into me, my entire identity, who I was, all of that, all the way into baptism. And then at eight, I was given this gift of the Holy Ghost. So who I was before that day, I had this perception that you know, my thoughts and my feelings and my emotions were mine. They're private to me. What I'm doing within myself and what I'm thinking inside my own mind, nobody knows, right? I can think my own thoughts within my own mind and have my own private experience in reality. And nobody needs to know that, right? That's the way it was, just being like a normal kid without this whole complex. Then at eight years old, I'm given the gift of the Holy Ghost after my baptism. And now inserted into my entire sense of reality, my personality, my way of seeing things, how I interact with the thoughts inside my own head, 
when I feel in a, and when I start feeling an emotion, now suddenly all of that is fractaled out, fractured out. Is it coming from the devil? Is it coming from the Holy Ghost? Are these my thoughts? Is this the spirit? Is this the light of Christ, which is like a whole other thing? Like your consciousness isn't even your own consciousness. It's the light of Christ. It's like none of it is you anymore. Suddenly, all of your thoughts and emotions and feelings, any good thing that happens to you, all of that is attributed to this ghost that was just basically you were just possessed with. So now he's the one that gets all the credit for anything that you did good. He's the one thinking all the good thoughts and putting them in your head. And your job is you're just now the confused one that doesn't know anything. Now, if you have a question and you're like, I don't know, should I do this or should I do that? Every single question, that's where you are. I don't know, should I do this or should I do that? The only way to get the answer now, because you've been baptized and have the gift of the Holy Ghost, is to do the protocol. You got to go kneel down and pray. You got to ask God, and then you got to listen to the Spirit, to that Holy Ghost, to tell you the answer. And I'm telling you over the course of my life, the reason I'm even making this video right now is that from those days on, that became the most broken, untrusting, unreliable, backwards system for trying to make decisions in my life that led me to marry someone I probably shouldn't have married led me to end up getting a divorce, led me to end up leaving the church, and has basically ruined almost every relationship that I had that was a member of the church. I've been almost completely cut off from my family because all of this stuff, when I go back home, is still something that everybody in my hometown and community is still doing and still believes and still operating by to where they will get a feeling like the Holy Ghost is telling them they're supposed to send me an email or to try and tell me to do this or tell me to do that. And they will listen to that psychotic, oppressive voice that was put into them through that ritual that they've been following their whole life before they will sit and use logic and think for themselves. And it was the same way that I was after I got baptized. I got completely baked in with this perception of trying to sort out, okay, when I finally made a decision and I know what to do, that means I got an answer from God through the Holy Ghost and I'm going to listen to that spirit. And then when it goes wrong, ah, you just flip it all around. I must have done something wrong. Maybe I wasn't worthy. God's teaching me a lesson and you've got a million different rationalizations around it. But all of this was baked into me as this really crazy start. And when my family was getting ready to do that and I got baptized, everything went up a notch when we started to get ready to go to the temple and I got introduced to the occult necromancy rituals of the temple and how all of that went to another level. But we're going to save that for the next one. So thanks you guys for listening to this part one. And let me know if you have any other questions or anything down in the comments below. If you want to watch my main series, go over to my Carl Crusher channel. I've got a Patreon where I do a, a meditation course, and a lot of inner circle stuff. I even have an Etsy store if you want to support what I do. Thanks, guys.